Hello, everybody. Um, welcome this afternoon to, or this morning, or whatever part of the day you're in, um, to, uh, to this presentation on uh, Dynamics 365. Um, as I was mentioned, my name is Brent Dawson. I, uh, I may not sound English because I am not. I am actually Canadian born, but I live in England. I've lived here for the last year and, uh, and quite enjoying it. So, so what are we going to look at today? Well, we've got three different sections we're going to take a look at. The first one is uh, an introduction to Dynamics. So sort of what is the, the idea behind Dynamics 365? Where did it come from? What's it for? Uh, then we're going to take a look at some of the ideas behind cloud computing. And we're going to take a look at, uh, from there, a look at what's part of the D365 application suite and sort of what they're, uh, what they're supposed to be uh, to use for. And then lastly, we'll end off with a bit of a Q&A session uh, for people who have questions. So uh, CRM and ERP systems have uh, been around for quite a few years, and uh, they started way back in sort of the mid-50s, 60s, uh, in the mainframe era, for those of you that uh, know or have or had to use a mainframe. Um, and uh, it, so that was sort of the start of the, uh, the, the ERP side of things, where you had centralized computing and uh, just uh, terminals that you would use to, um, to communicate with the central system to be able to, uh, to do different types of work. Uh, from there, you uh, in the mid-60s uh, to somewhere in the mid-80s, uh, you had um, database marketing systems that had been uh, created and um, and built into uh, you know everyday use so that people could start doing things like telemarketing, you know, getting the phone calls that everybody loves to get, uh, and and keeping track of all of that sort of information. Um, late in the mid '80s, uh, or in the mid to late '80s, uh, CRM was sort of initiated. Uh, the idea of the custom customer relationship management system. Uh, and then also uh, enterprise planning systems, ERP systems, uh, with tools such as Salesforce, uh, Microsoft CRM, you know, those sorts of things, SAP on the ERP side, uh, JD Edwards, those sorts of tools. Um, and then in the 2000s and the 2010s, we get into the sort of cloud-based uh, implementations of, uh, of tools, specifically of the CRM side of things. And... Um, and then from there, we get into the Dynamics 365 family of applications. So Dynamics 365 is actually made up of several different applications, and we'll take a look at it here in a bit. But um, most of the applications that fall into the Dynamics platform are ones that Microsoft have, has acquired over the past few years. So as an example, Microsoft AX, Dynamics AX was, was uh, acquired from a company called Extapa, which is what actually built it. Um, there are components that are part of the CRM that are from other systems as well. And so, um, you know, uh, there's Great Plains, which is an accounting package, and, and those sorts of things. So there's a number of different applications that Microsoft has developed in-house and, uh, and from scratch. Uh, but there's also a number of applications that, you know, may sound familiar, um, but... Um, the uh, uh, you know the the system is sort of a conglomeration of uh, of other tools uh, that uh, Microsoft has, has acquired and collected over the past few years. So digital transformation. Everybody is talking about digital transformation the last little little while within the last five years or so ago, and digital transformation, um, depending upon sort of the, the the point of view that you're coming at. Uh, digital transformation could be a lot of different things. Digital transformation could be the process of getting rid of paper-based or old manual-based processes and automating those things to, uh, to be done on a computer system. So that's one idea of digital transformation. Um, another type of digital transformation is something that you might see in an airport where you check in at the check-in counter instead of there being a, a hard sign that says, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, the United check-in window. Uh, it has a, a, a graph that uh, is a, a graphical tool or a graphical board that can be changed because it's digital. And so, you know, it might be United now and then tomorrow it might be Air Canada or somebody of that nature. So there's, that's another type of digital transformation. But ultimately, the idea behind digital transformation is to create connected, seamless systems that share information across different platforms. So here we've got, in this particular case, we've got customer engagement information. Uh, we have uh, operational uh, information that uh, keeps the business running. 
We have uh, transformation products, which could be anywhere from physical products to uh, different processes and digital processes, uh, empowerment of employees, and all of those things working together and interconnected together um, allow for business applications to be more robust and generate information so that customers have an ideal experience as to what it is that they're working on or how they're trying to get information. Um, employees are empowered to do their best to make sure that the information that they're receiving is, is accurate and correct and operations can be effective and efficient across the business and ultimately the CEO and the CFO can say, yes, my business is working well. And lastly, the best products and services are being delivered and developed so that the customer is happy ultimately. So this is the, the uh, 10,000 foot view of what is in the uh, Dynamics 365 business applications tier. Um, and a lot of organizations are here referred to as MBA. Don't get it confused with uh, Masters of Business Administration. So my role, as was mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction, is as a pre-sales architect. So I work in the MBA department in the, the, the tech company that I work for. And so my role is basically to assist the salespeople from a technical point of view, working with customers to get systems and solutions in place. But sort of the, the idea behind um, this system, if we look at it from, from just the purely the CRM side of things, uh, CRM, as I mentioned before, started showing up somewhere in the, the 1980s, early 90s, um, and, uh, and that's sort of around the time of, the, of uh, when PCs became more popular and we got away from centralized computing. Um, but you'll notice here that uh, all of the data and all of the applications work together to generate intelligent data. So as part of this, we have a number of different tools. We have um, dynamic sales, customer service, marketing, products, customer insights. Those are all what used to be CRM. They've all been broken out into separate packages and separate applications, and it's mostly around licensing. Uh, to identify which tools you have. All of the CRM or all of the other types of tools are based on the Power Platform, which means that they all use the Dataverse as their back end. Um, Dynamics 365 Finance and Supply Chain Management is slightly different, however, it, it does not use the Dataverse. It's a separate data entity, um, and, but it can share information with all of the other applications. And so you'll see here that we have tools such as Commerce, which is a web front end tool, Business Central, which used to be called Navision, which is for small organizations that want to have an ERP environment in their, in their uh, organization, sales, marketing, customer service, field services, project service automation, finance, supply chain management, and human resources. So those are all of the different applications that make up the Microsoft Business Application Suite and you can pick and choose which of these items that you wish to use. You license them based on the tools that you want to work with and, you know, and make your organization work around those tools. There are some other tools that are available that are not directly part of the dynamic suite. That includes some of the artificial intelligence tools that are part of Azure, including uh, tools for sales, customer service, marketing, product and customer insights as well as the ability to use mixed reality using uh, HoloLens and, and that sort of thing uh, for things like uh, sales, customer service, uh, customer insights, project service automation, field services, and those sorts of activities. But all of them have the capability of working and interacting with Power Apps, Power Platform, and using automation through Power Automate. So uh, why the Microsoft Business Applications? One of the things that we would like to be able to do is um, make sure that uh, companies have the ability to adapt to new changes in their business environment. Um, when you have very defined systems uh, that are hard to update, hard to replicate, hard to modify and whatever, it makes the ability of your business to be adaptable much more difficult. And so we don't want to get into a situation where you know, you buy a system, you pay a million dollars for it, and then, oh my God, it's gonna cost me another million dollars if I wanna change it. So it, it, it's not a very efficient way of being able to, to conduct your business. Uh, so using tools like Dynamics allows you to do uh, modifications to the system, but also allows you to, um, you know, expand and, and modify and adapt to how your business will use the tool as it needs to going forward. 
Um, it's also extendable, which means that it will uh, apply to each organization's needs. You know, every organization does a few things. They buy things, they sell things, um, you know, they consume things, you know, they create purchase orders, they pay for vendor invoices, that sort of stuff. Everybody kind of does all that stuff the same uh, in, in, you know, standard business processes or business practices. But there are certain things like, you know, sales discounts. So I might give a discount for somebody who buys a thousand widgets. And when I do that, you know, there might be a special price list that um, needs to be assigned to that, you know, group of buyers and group of individuals that are buying those products uh, so that they get the appropriate price. So it allows you to extend and, and, you know, customize and massage it to fit your organization. Also, as I mentioned prior, it's integrated with the Power Platform. So it takes advantage of Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power BI, as well as being able to download and integrate other third-party applications from App Source. So, uh, you know, as an example, um, Dynamics 365 Finance, you know, you do all your invoicing, you can process your invoices and pay your invoices and so forth, but there's no invoice automation you know, in terms of processing, I mean, in, uh, processing incoming invoices. So if a, you know, a company sends an invoice to you, you get the invoice, you have to hard code it into the system and blah, blah, blah. If you use a tool, let's say like uh, uh, A extensions, A extensions can actually uh, OCR an attachment so as a PDF, um, identify the appropriate fields in the file, and then fill in automatically the information into the, the invoice register in F and O. And so it'll be de de done for you. So that's the type of an, uh, an application add-on or third-party application add-on that you can put into the uh, into the dynamic system. There's lots of arrows here, but ultimately what this is showing you is that all of the data is unified, okay? It's an open platform. And so by allowing for not only applications that are written inside of Microsoft, but also partners to be able to add applications to the system, and customers being able to, to modify it for their own purposes, then we are allowing for um, data to be manipulated and applications to be used in any way, shape, or form that that organization requires. Um, and it could be in uh, a siloed system or it could be in a system that shares information. So as an example here, you'll see that not only do we have the Dynamics 365 tools going on here, we also have basic Office 365, so things, things like email and Exchange, and that sort of thing. Um, we may interact with LinkedIn for like the human resources side of things. You know, if we're trying to put a, a, a person into a new role or a position that the organization has, um, we might go and, and use LinkedIn to try and find an appropriate person that we would like to have them apply. And then also the partner solutions, you know, things like uh, as mentioned, A extensions or other types of tools that can be added into the system. A couple of specific uh, individual uh, applications that exist within the uh, the system is uh, the first one is going to be the Dynamics 365 Sales. So Dynamics 365 Sales, as I mentioned before, is sort of the sales side of what used to be CRM, and so it's there for things like tracking the leads and qualifying leads, and then creating a sales order and, you know, all those sorts of things that you would do as a standard sales process. But we also have the capability of extending that to using a tool called Sales Insights. And so what Sales Insights does is that it takes a look at all of the, the tracking information around previous sales that you have in your system, and it uses artificial intelligence to look at and find trends. And so here's an example. We've got three different trends that customers are talking about. So um, we're looking at 3D printing and fabrication. Okay, that's a popular subject. Lots of people like 3D printing. 3D printers have come down in prices uh, considerably from when they first came out, which means that they're now affordable by the average consumer. So, you know, that's, that's something that a lot of people are interested in. Fabrication as well, where you're fabricating different types of components using 3D printing uh, to, uh, to, you know, all sorts of stuff. I read recently that uh, somebody did a 3D printer of a replacement heart valve, and uh, they've been testing it in animals, and it seems to work quite well. So that might be a human solution or a, a solution to a human problem that uh, nobody ever thought about five years ago. It's like, oh, we can actually print a valve and make it work in the system. Another thing that we could use in this case for the artificial intelligence is looking at um, 
sentiment values about our organization. And in this example, it says that they've noticed higher negative sentiments on average. Um, that may mean that things are breaking more often. You might have a quality control issue. Uh, you know, there, there might be a number of things that, uh, that are dri driving this. And, uh, and so you'll need to make sure that, um, you know, you, you use this as a way to improve the business. And so you can take a look at uh, sort of the, uh, the, um, the feelings of an organizational uh, or the feelings of customers of an organization. And the third one that we've got listed here is uh, three brands have been detected across the sales site. So it's, it's specifying, oh, okay, so these customers are talking about these specific brands. Maybe we need to bring more of these brands items in because they seem to be quite popular. Uh, you know, and so that way you can sort of forecast how uh, you might potentially sell something um, within an organization. But the key here is that all of these sales insights are being looked at by the Azure machine learning uh, module uh, and running some machine learning and slash artificial intelligence against it and coming up with scenarios that might improve how your business is functioning or take a look at what your business is doing currently. Customer insights, same idea, except this one is geared towards specifically customers. Uh, this way you can get a holistic view of customers, bringing together all of their transactional processes, observational items, and behavioral data, uh, and use those to, uh, to build different products and, uh, and offerings that uh, potentially might be um, useful to customers. Um, you can dis uh, discover insights and take action against uh, be proactive in terms of being able to sell stuff or bring inventory in or, you know, potentially fix a problem that you have in the organization. Um, you can embed these customer insight uh, cards into dynamic business applications so that um, as you're doing certain things, you can have triggers executed and those triggers will then process a uh, type of command or a, an application or something of that nature through Power Automate that will um, help you work with those customers and also connecting and adapting the uh, applications themselves to the utilization of things. And this is from an end user point of view of utilizing tools like Power BI and Sales Insights and so forth, so that they get an idea of how to work with and deal with customer information. Customer service insights. Customer service insights, again, at the same kind of concept, except this where we're looking at satisfaction and loyalty of a customer. Uh, so by building loyalty and making sure that the customer is happy, we will obviously be able to sell to that customer or utilize that customer uh, more often, right? Which means that ultimately the business is functioning better and will make money. Uh, we can we could use uh, what's called a customer satisfaction score or a CSAT, uh, and using the artificial intelligence services, we can then go in and have it extract out and take a look at um, trends and uh, help us to determine, again, whether or not you know, we have an issue within the organization, if there's something that needs to be fixed and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, this is very handy because it'll help you determine sort of the numbers of levels of or satisfaction of individuals with things like customer service support or you know, those sorts of things. Because you can also, as part of this, use a survey process where you will actually send the survey to an individual user, they'll fill it out, and then the tools can actually interpret the responses and give you an answer to it. There's also marketing insights. This is taking a look at uh, uh, trends and uh, react to those trends out into the market. So you could create uh, screenshots and snapshots of key trends. You could create KPI indicators, uh, all that sort of stuff, and, uh, and allow you to, again, try and be ahead of the trend in the markets so that you can make more money and be ahead of your competitors. One of the very handy tools that uh, is part of the dynamic suite is this fraud protection, uh, sorry, D365 fraud protection. Um, and really what this is for is for you to prevent, basically as a business, being taken for fraudulent access or fraudulent transactions. So I'll give you an example. Um, there's an airline uh, in North America that, uh, uh, this couple had been booked to get on a flight and uh, leave the country. And they were in a hurry to leave the country. I don't know why they were in a hurry to leave the country, but they were. And so uh, this friend of theirs booked them two flights out of Canada to somewhere in Central or Eastern Europe. 
And uh, so when they got to the airport, they uh, went up to the ticket counter. And the person at the ticket counter says, oh, I'm sorry, these tickets have been canceled because they're not valid. And um, they're like, well, what do you mean they're not valid? And they're like, well, because they were purchased with a fraudulent credit card. And so these two people were very adamant that they had to leave the country and they were not happy and many different things were going on. But what ended up happening was, is that the company uses the Dynamics Fraud Protection as part of their implementation in their organization. And so even though the transaction had been processed and the tickets had been purchased, the system still took a look at that transaction and realized, hey, wait a minute. This is not a valid transaction. The person that made the transaction or used this credit card wasn't the owner of the, the credit card. So the system notified the booking agents, they canceled the ticket, they notified uh, the bank and the credit card company so that the transactions could be frozen. And then unfortunately for the two people that were trying to leave the country, they got stuck in the middle of it because it was used by a, a stolen credit card. But the fraud protection tool is very useful, specifically when you're doing online transactions, because it can help you not only reduce the overall acceptance level of, of items that are purchased fraudulently within your organization, but will also help to educate not only your employees, but your customers of the fraud, the types of fraud activity that can exist and occur, not only out on the internet, but at, at you know, just, just in regular life. I, I, I laughed at my father because my father is retired. He's 77 now. And, um, you know, computing was starting to be a good thing and a, you know, a big thing. And, of course, that's what I've basically been in my whole career. Uh, my father doesn't understand it. Well, at least at the time he didn't. He gets it now. He appreciates the fact that I'm in IT because I don't live at home anymore. Mind you, I am 51. Um, and, uh, and so we were talking one day about he wanted to purchase some tickets. I think it was for a baseball game. He wanted to purchase some tickets for a baseball game. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, we'll just go online and we'll, we'll you know, book the tickets. He says, no, no, I don't trust being online. I'm not putting my credit card number on the internet. I don't trust it. I said, well, then how are you gonna buy them? He says, well, we'll call the 800 number and I'll give my credit card to them over the phone. And I'm like, well, how is that more secure? And he, he's like, well, what do you need? I said, well, it, you know, there could be somebody listening on the phone. The person on the other end could not necessarily be entirely trustworthy and write your credit card number down and keep all that information and sometime later use it to purchase something in China or in Hong Kong or, you know, somewhere in Europe. And you'll never know until you get the bill and it's too late. He's like, hmm. So I finally got him convinced that maybe using his credit card online was actually safer because of tools like fraud protection and that sort of stuff than you know, giving your, your credit card number to somebody over a telephone line. Um, I also still remember, and it's not that long ago, where you would give your, you know, if you went for dinner, you would give your credit card to the waitress and she would take it to another place in the restaurant and she would process the credit card there instead of doing it at your table with you being there. And again, they could make a copy of the credit card, they could you know, do all sorts of stuff off of it and skim information off of it that you had no idea. Um, and so by using these online tools and using things like fraud protection will protect the overall uh, integrity of your business, plus make sure that the customers are kept happy because you're not going to get taken for, uh, for a ride. Product insights. Uh, this is for managing and being a proactive customer service and surprise, uh, upgrading uh, with when you're able to upgrade features and roll up new software fixes for applications that you've written. Uh, and this is generally going to be useful when you're working on things such as Internet of Things technologies, where you've got devices that are monitoring different types of things, whether it's temperatures or pressures or moistures or those sorts of things. And so the, uh, the system will let you use the product information that you're getting from these different devices to be proactive in how you're going to be able to produce new features or new updates to those particular products. And um, again, uh, it, it comes right down to whether the devices or the information that you're storing is you know, local type of information or if it's global type of information. And uh, you know, being able to understand how that information is using or has been created and what it's used for will allow you to better understand what the customer needs and ultimately be able to be proactive 
and say, here, Mr. Customer or Mrs. Customer, this is what I think you want to try next. And, you know, this is why, and, and you go on from there. So by using that information in the, uh, in the AI tool, you could be proactive in trying to figure out what the customer will want in terms of features, and then be able to um, put those items into place before you get there. Uh, the next thing is mixed reality. A lot of organizations have uh, got into the idea now of this idea of mixed reality. So the idea originally started when um, the, the, the concept of virtual reality came out, right? So if you remember back maybe five years ago, you could buy a headset where you could take your cell phone and pop your cell phone into it, and then you could play video games, and it would be like um, you're playing in a, in a virtual world, right? So that's the whole idea of Meta from Facebook and uh, the Microsoft Mixed Reality Environments and some of these other ones as well. Um, you know, even games like Sims and, uh, and um, Minecraft and all those sorts of things. Those are all sort of virtual reality games where you, you're sort of in the game, but you're not really because you, obviously you're not digital, you're human, and so you can't actually be there. But now what we can do is that we can take that virtual reality technology. Actually, sorry, one of the funny things about virtual reality is that when you're not in the virtual reality game and you're watching other people participate in it, some of the things that they do is hysterical. So like, for instance, if they're playing tennis, they, they think they're playing tennis, but to the average person that's watching them, they're not really, it looks really funny. Um, but uh, so that's, that's sort of the, uh, the, the silly part of the of virtual mixed realities. In the mixed reality environment, we have three components that make up the whole um, sort of idea of this reality. So we have the computer itself. Uh, we have the, the computer, which is there for um, obviously the capability of getting you into that virtual space, right? And uh, we also have the person themselves that are actually trying to interact with this computer system. And then we have the environment that ultimately is, um, you know, the, the place that they're, that they're trying to live in or that they're trying to work in. And mixed reality is that centerpiece in the middle where human, computer, and environment all overlap, okay? So some examples of where you would use things of mixed reality would be, um, let's say that I'm a service technician and I have to go and service a boiler on a furnace. Let's say I'm going someplace and I have to, I have to service this boiler. I've never really seen it. I've read the book about it. I've not actually had to physically work on it prior, prior to me being there. So I might need some help. So with mixed reality, I can actually use a, 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 like a HoloLens type of a device, a camera, whatever, and I can actually take a service person, let's say an engineer back at the office, to walk me through visually, like they were there, but in a virtual reality, how to fix that particular device or that particular boiler. And so it is a very useful tool, and, and I think it'll have great strides in sort of the, the service, uh, field services and repair part of an organization. I'm not a huge fan of uh, this whole metaverse sort of thing. Um, I just think it's a way for people to try and escape reality again, but you know, not everybody wants to live in a virtual, a, a physical uh, video game. But uh, in the business world where you're trying to solve a problem and you, you might have a barrier because of some sort of physical influence in the world, this is a way for you to get past that physical barrier and make yourselves more efficient and, and useful within the, within the business world. And it is expensive, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, halo, halo lenses and, uh, and those sorts of things are not inexpensive. Uh, so if you are going to get into this mixed reality sort of environment, there is a, a huge cost to it. Uh, for the equipment and for the uh, the space and the communications that are required for those things to function properly. Now, that will change at some point in the future. Uh, you know, as normal, when everything comes out, the prices do tend to go down over a period of time. But at this point, the costs are very, very expensive. And um, so, if you are going to to you know to to make that um, commitment to it you do need to realize that there's going to be a hefty cost associated to it.
So the mixed reality, as you can see in this as this chart, is sort of that middle space, right? So we have you know the physical world, you know the one we live in, the digital world, the Minecrafty type of world, and then everything in between, right? So the physical reality, you might be able to augment certain things, so you know the virtual reality type of thing that you get from the digital side of things, but it's that idea of being able to augment that information digitally with the virtual information or the virtual information with the digital information and that's what you get in terms of the mixed reality so you know if you've got the halo lens on you can look at your hand you still see your hand but superimposed over it you might see some other thing so this example here that you see in this diagram is um the lady is fixing looks like a cyclotron um and so she's you know doing everything but she also sees the gentleman that's sitting there in the team's meeting, and he's basically kind of showing her how to fix that thing uh, without actually having to physically be there, right? So she's, she's combining physical reality and mixed reality to give us ultimately remote assist, where, you know, this person can actually see this engineer, as an example, in the team's meeting, but can also still physically see the item that they're touching and being able to repair it. You can use it for guides, right? So, um, you know, quite often uh, men are accused of never actually following user guides. Um, I'm kind of guilty of that, although I've been in this business long enough that I know that if I want to find the information, it's probably written in a user manual somewhere. Although my girlfriend has joked with me once before that if she ever wants to hide a secret from me, she just puts it in a user manual and then I'll never find it. Um, but in this particular case, instead of sitting there and actually flipping through a book and trying to actually do what it is that you need to do, you'll notice that it, it superimposes the, the wrench that the person is using to fix it based on the instructions right with them. So they can actually see what it is that they're trying to do. Oh, I need to rotate this two and a half times, right? And so I need to have a torque of uh, 10 uh, micrometers, uh, or, or sorry, three foot pounds per of torque um, uh, on this particular bolt, right? So they can not only see what, again, what they're doing physically, but they can also see the virtual version of it. And that's when you get the whole mixed reality piece. It also allows you to do product uh, visualizations, right? So um, all of the different things we've looked at, are allowing us to create virtualized products that we can then see and work with. So the, the gentleman, the two gentlemen are standing in front of the purple board. So the third, the top row, the third uh, picture over. That's an interesting one. Um, if you've ever seen television shows like CSI, uh, Vegas, or whatever, they always have these neat things where they have these like like holographic boards and people are writing on them and it's doing all these other kind of kind of cool stuff or whatever. Well, that's sort of what that is is getting to at this point now. We're using virtual reality lenses like HoloLens and using mixed reality. We can actually create some of those boards and drawing items and stuff. Now, unless you're wearing the lenses, you won't be able to see them, but at least it gives you the opportunity to, to play in that space. So it gives you the capability of literally drawing on a whiteboard without the whiteboard being there. It looks kind of silly from the people that aren't actually participating in it, but from the person's people that are, it is a very useful way of being able to, to design and, and to draw things. Um, so with Product Visualize, you can um, help sellers meet customers' needs faster by using mixed reality. So you can do engineering on the fly as an example. Um, you could place uh, 3D digital twins of products in, in the customer's environments to see how they work. Uh, you could do um, uh, 3D model representations of products so that they can actually see what the product looks like. And from there, you could then do a 3D printing version of it so that they would get you know, the plastic 3D printed version. Um, it could help them, uh, in terms of costs, avoid over, overly uh, time-consuming costs for different types of repairs or products or, or whatnot um, by using the virtual reality to identify the problems and fix it prior to having to go and actually tear things apart and so forth. And through integration with sales, you, you could also use this information to tie into future sales opportunities uh, and uh, you know, other types of sales that may occur in, in, the, in the near future. 
And so that's what the, the, uh, the Dynamics 365 layout is for. So here they're virtually creating a layout for how to set up speakers and microphones and stuff in a business. So to gain um, all of the information around this, we first of all need to understand the ideas of cloud computing, okay? So all of the, the, the previous 15, 20 slides, but especially around the customer insight stuff, uh, the, 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 the virtual reality, mixed reality information, is all really good stuff. It's, it's actually quite handy, it's very useful, and it's really cool stuff, to technology to play with. But if you don't understand how that stuff works in the sense of what it sits on top of, um, it's not really going to give you any uh, advantage in your organization. So we're gonna reel, reel you back in and bring you back to some of the boring stuff, and we're gonna talk about cloud computing fundamentals. So um, with cloud computing, we have three different types of, uh, of cloud computing that's available to us. Um, if we're using a, a, a virtual machine structure, generally we have the virtual machines that are running. They could be running some sort of operating system. In this case, it'll be running Linux or Windows. And the applications run on top of that guest OS inside of a virtual computer. Right, so there's virtual hardware that is executing that code. That virtual information sits on top of what's called a hypervisor, which controls the interaction between the host operating system and the physical hardware that that host operating system is, is installed onto and the virtual operating system and hardware. So it's, it's there to uh, it basically uh, be the gatekeeper for how transmission of information is sent from one system to another. On the other hand, we also have this idea of container applications, which is using a tool such as Kerberos or um, uh, I don't know what it's called. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name off the top of my head now. But Kerberos, or not Kerberos, uh, Kubernetes, um, sorry, Kubernetes. Um, and so being able to use sort of the, uh, the idea of those sorts of containers where you're no longer required to have the virtual hardware and the virtual OS running. You just need to install the application. And, um, and uh, from there, it will then do the same sorts of things. It will interact with the host operating system in the physical environment. The last idea is this idea of a serverless application. And so when we get into SaaS solutions like Dynamics 365, and we get into these SaaS-based solutions, software as a service, they don't actually have a server that they're running on the back end. There are virtual machines and SQL servers and other types of devices that are running, but from the end user point of view, all of that is managed by Microsoft. There's nothing that the customer, that the end user has to be responsible for. Uh, and so the applications functions run on serverless runtime applications that run against the host operating system and hardware. And so from a, from a system's point of view, if you were to try and log into that server, technically the server doesn't exist because there is no uh, physical hardware or virtual hardware and an operating system that those functions are executing against. Um, ultimately, it's still running against an operating system. It's just not in the con conventional way that we would uh, normally assume it. So the benefits of cloud computing, um, cost, because you don't uh, have to worry about capital expenses of buying hardware and software, setting it up, running on-site data centers, having the racking systems, having the cooling systems, having the power bills, having the IT experts on staff that can manage all that stuff. Right? So you, you can help to reduce your overall costs. It's a global scale, can be accessed anywhere in the world, um, well, except very few places. Um, but uh, it's accessible everywhere around the world. Um, it can increase performance. So unlike in a physical virtual environment, uh, sorry, in a physical uh, systems environment, if I have a system that's running slowly, my only options are to upgrade the system or put more memory or bigger CPU or whatnot into it. If I'm running in a cloud-based system and I need performance, I can pick up the phone and say, hey, Mr. Microsoft, give me another 10% resources and they can just allocate those resources to you as needed. And then as subsequently, if you're over consuming resources, you can have them removed from your system. You don't have to go in and actually physically remove anything. This Microsoft can reduce your overall 
uh, load of, of, uh, of um, resources that they're assigned to you. Uh, it's very secure, again, because Microsoft has to fulfill requirements from countries and organizations all around the world for um, uh, security compliance and data storage compliance and all those sorts of things. It is very secure. It's quite speedy. Your single, single biggest limitation is your size of your bandwidth. Uh, and generally, that's going to be the bandwidth on your site, not the bandwidth on the Microsoft site, because as we've already mentioned, Microsoft will be able to increase the performance by adding more resources to your implementation. So it's generally going to be on the user end user side that the speed makes a difference. Um, it increases productivity because the data centers require uh, a lot of racking and stacking and hardware maintenance and mess server patching and all sorts of other things that have to happen as part of a, uh, of a server um, management process. Whereas in a, a cloud computing, that's all managed by somebody else. I don't have to worry about patching servers. I don't have to worry about doing firmware updates. I don't have to worry about changing the latest piece of hardware for or an old piece of hardware for a new one and having the downtime to do it. So all of that is managed for you by the cloud hosting provider. And it's reliable, right? I can think of two times in the last five years that Microsoft has gone offline for more than an hour. Um, which is not bad when you think about it. I mean, they're still hitting, I think, four nines is, is, is what they're hitting, or three nines, or three nine five, or something like that. Um, so uh, they're pretty good in terms of availability. And if a data center does become unavailable, the systems automatically can be set up to fail over to other data centers so that your, your access to those resources is, uh, is not interrupted. Um, as mentioned, Microsoft fulfills all of the different types of requirements for compliance uh, are all around the world. So things like criminal justice information services, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance star certifications, GDPR for those of us in Europe, the EU model class, uh, clauses, uh, HIPAA for health insurance in the US, um, all the ISO standards, uh, service organization controls, the National Institute of Standards, Technologies, and Cyber Frameworks, and the UK government G Cloud. These are just a list of some of the compliance that Microsoft follows. Uh, if you go to the Microsoft website, you can find the security compliance tab, and it will list you all of the different systems that they have to run audits for on a yearly basis, and the, the results and the reports that are generated as part of those audit results. Okay, so the... Uh, the three types of clouds that, that we're going to have or that are primarily existing in the world um, are listed here. So first of all, if we're doing an on-premise application, obviously we're not doing any uh, cloud infrastructure, although it is possible to do private clouds. The private clouds are um, they're difficult to maintain. It's still as much of an infrastructure management, administrative management as you would if you're just doing individual PCs. Um, but on-premise, you are responsible for everything, right? So you manage the applications, you manage the runtime, you manage the middleware, you manage the servers, the networking, everything is your responsibility. Something breaks, the phone picks up, they call you and say it's broken. The three types of clouds, though, is uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And here you can see that as you get further and further away from the on-premise software deployment and hardware deployment, the amount of stuff that you manage is fewer and fewer and fewer. So from an infrastructure as a service, uh, you're just responsible for the applications and the data and that sort of stuff because it's still running on a virtual machine and they will manage the VMs and the storage and networking. Uh, on the platform as a service, you're just responsible for managing the application data. And then lastly, on software as a service, um, the applications itself are managed Really, the only thing that you have to worry about from a management point of view is the actual data that you're putting into the system. Okay, uh, so the last tool that's part of the sort of the dynamics family, although it's not a direct part of the uh, application, is uh, Azure DevOps. So Azure DevOps is the uh, tools that were used to uh, manage collaboration in order to release code in a more efficient, cooperative, and stable manner, um, and works with um, uh, the different types of uh, components within the system. Uh, so you would use the Azure DevOps to um, house and maintain all of the data that is used and code that is used for your Dynamics deployment. 
It will also be used to host um, the project plans, uh, all of the items that need to have development behind them, as well as test plans and test scripts that you can utilize uh, against the, uh, the system. It also allows you to utilize um, automation for things that uh, you can test using automated tools. Uh, and so that is a, another way for us to be able to, uh, to, able to manage and uh, control how the system is deployed. All right, so uh, deployments. There are a number of different types of uh, trials that we can get to. Uh, so it is possible if you need to try something, you can go to trials.dynamics.com. And from there, you can create uh, uh, different trials. I think they're 60-day trials. Uh, for things such as sales, customer service, field service, project auto service automation, uh, finance and operations, business central, talent, and retail. So all of these um, can be created using uh, your work credentials. Um, it'll create a temporary environment for you to go in and play with. Uh, and within that trial environment, you can um, uh, basically uh, set up the, uh, the system so that um, you can try it out. You, you can't do much customization with it, but you can at least try standard functionality, things like workflows and processing of invoices and those sorts of things uh, to be able to, uh, to, to um, you know, see how the system runs and uh, whether that's something that you want to do. Um, the next tool is uh, called Lifecycle Services. And so Lifecycle Services is the management tool that you'll use for Dynamics to uh, control the deployment and uh, implementation of, of projects. So um, if we're doing a project for uh, Dynamics uh, Finance, as an example, this is where we'll go through and we'll follow a methodology to uh, do an analysis and design of what it is that we're trying to complete. Uh, then we're going to do to testing and deploying, and then ultimately the daily operation of it. And there are a number of different tasks that are part of these implementation methodologies. So you can see here that as part of the analysis phase, uh, we're going to uh, complete the LCS project configuration in LCS for our organization. Uh, we're going to invite the project team. We're going to configure Azure DevOps. We're going to sign up for uh, ProQ project quality mo uh, monitoring. Uh, then we're going to deploy demo environments, publishes, and uh, all that sort of stuff. So it is a very, very guided and step-by-step -step process that you'll follow for a project to go from inception to deployment and reality and, and user utilization on a daily basis. And so we will manage tools and uh, projects such as uh, finance and operations, customer engagement, um, uh, commerce, uh, human resources, all of those types of projects and software implementations are going to be done through the LCS tool. Um, also, we have a number of different shared libraries that we can utilize, so we don't always have to create everything from scratch as part of this creation process. Um, we can take, in this example, other packages that we've created for things like retail or uh, downloadable VHDs or marketing or any of those sorts of things, and we can apply those to different environments. So we could create and you know, fire up a new uh, UAT environment. Uh, put our deployment on it and be able to uh, to execute it. Some other things that we could do with LCS um, is tracking um, all of the uh, business processes that we're going to do. So this is an example here of something called the business process modeler. And so what the business process library or the business process modeler library does is that it goes through and takes a look at all of the business processes that you have in your organization and helps you to understand how the business process library is going to be utilized within your organization. So it can do a couple of different things. A, it'll be there to help you find and identify gaps uh, and, and do fit gap analysis and, uh, and be able to resolve those gaps and, and, uh, and make sure that the system is going to work as required. Um, it can also be used to help automate testing because from here we can have a step-by-step -step, uh, function of what the actual business process is from an electronics point of view. So we can save the amount of time that is, uh, is required. And also um, this can be used as a, uh, um, a historical tool as well so that you can see all of the different things that are happening in the system that may or may not implement or in, in impact on how your business processes are executed. And lastly, we also have the capability of doing things graphically with Visio. 
And so here you'll see that uh, under properties on the right hand side, we have um, process steps, you know, go to the procurement and sourcing, blah, blah, blah. And this is the steps that are actually going to be executed to make the business process work as designed. Right? And so this business process is, is combined with uh, other tools such as Visio and Task Recorder and some other things to help you organize and consolidate how those businesses execution tasks are going to be uh, completed in the system. So another tool that's available for us uh, within the system is called the Power Platform. And the Power Platform has an administration center that's part of the office suite. And uh, what this is for is to basically give you the, the underlying ground level implementation of Power Platform in your organization. Uh, so here, this is where you're going to create your, your uh, environments. Uh, you're going to manage your solutions. You're going to set up and, and deal with all the help and support. This is where you'll also set up data gateways and integration with different layers of information and different processes, as well as all of the data policies to protect the information that exists within that dataverse. And then from there, we're going to be able to utilize the different Dynamics platforms. Now, as I mentioned previously, all of the dynamics, what were used to be customer engagement or CRM, are based on the dataverse, so what the power platform is. Uh, finance and operations or finance and supply chain, depending upon how you call it today, uh, is a different data, data sphere, data platform. So they don't sit on the same data platform. But there is integrations available, specifically called dual write, that will allow you to integrate data from both of those two systems and uh, work together uh, seamlessly. Um, but let's take a look at some of the uh, the benefits of the different tools um, that are available. So we're going to start with some of the CE ones, beginning with sales. So the purpose of sales is to um, basically take uh, the sales side of work. So uh, role-based solutions to deliver a sales uh, uh, relationship with a customer allows for productivity to uh, to be uh, to, to make the user sorry to make the cut the uh, the salesperson more efficient. Um, it allows for built-in intelligence to help uh, get optimal outcomes and is adaptable, so it can grow and make life uh, a lot better for you. The benefits include, um, as it says, empowering sellers to drive personal engagement with their customers. So you have a seller, um, you have a manager, you have a customer. The manager's job is responsibility is, is basically sales performance and customer management. And the sales job, seller's job is that personal engagement with the customer and ultimately get them to buy something, right? So here we're just making sure that, um, that the, the, the business process itself is smooth and efficient and repeatable because we know that one size does not fit all for every organization, right? So we want to make sure that um, that whatever data is or whatever that we're trying to sell to individual organizations is that it will probably be new, be unique to your organization uh, because nobody else makes it or only you have this particular feature in it. And uh, this helps to build trust, loyalty and uh, insight with your customers and being able to predict and help to, you know, uh, make valid uh, observations on sales in future years. Um, marketing is basically there to help you create graphical messages uh, for email and online content, uh, design interactive customer journeys, uh, analyze documentation on marketing for return on investments, tap into LinkedIn's business prospects and, uh, and leads uh, processes, uh, configure and, and do uh, surveys for, for things that uh, you'll want some results back from your organization. And also I'll help you uh, create publicly uh, sponsored events. Uh, you know, so putting together uh, trade shows and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and as part of this uh, marketing thing, we want to generate the leads from the different channels that we have, which will then go into sales. Once they're in sales, we want to be able to nurture and prioritize the leads that uh, we've created. And then lastly, we want to be able to deliver those, uh, those leads products based on the requirements that that lead has generated, right? And so as we nurture this process and we go through the process, we get to have a more targeted 
multi-channel process against individual customers because A, we know that they're willing to, to purchase from us and B, that we know that they're willing to uh, interact with us you know, on, on different types of things if they have issues, if they don't have issues and so forth. And that leads us into customer service and dynamics. Customer service and dynamics allows us to have um, you know, uh, the relationship between the organization and an individual within the organization and the customer. Um, it allows for us to have uh, proactive servicing, so we can do remote, remote device commands, proactive insights using things like IoT sensors. We can tell you, uh, you know, when things are going to break. I'll give you a, a real life example of that one, and this is from 30 years ago when I was in high school, which is sort of hard to say. But Xerox had a photocopier that would phone Xerox to tell them I'm going to break in a thousand pages. And so the, the Xerox photocopier technician could literally be standing there when the machine goes offline. And so, okay, zip zap, the change the part, done, and out the door, right? Um, vending machines nowadays do the same thing with IoT sensors and vending machines. You can um, have a vending machine call the, the, the vending the machine owner and say, hey, I'm almost out of product, you need to come and fill me. Uh, you know, and that, the, uh, the, the vending machine one was actually invented, I believe, for, if the story that I know is correct, is was invented by uh, a computer science engineering student at MIT because he got annoyed when he had to get up and go to the Coke machine to find out that it was empty because it kept interrupting his programming. So what he did is he got permission from the vending machine company, I'm assuming Coca-Cola, and he, he went and put a network card in it wired it up to the, to the network at the MIT, and he created it so that every uh, uh, row of, of pop cans would have a specific weight when it was full. And so if you, uh, what it would do is it would calculate what the weight was. It would know then that, that there'd be X number of cans of available in that particular product. And so if you went on in, you could go and look at that pop machine and it would say there's two cans left. And you would know whether or not you should get up and go to the pop machine because there'd be pop in it or not. Um, that's the, you know, that's a brilliant idea. It didn't take much to do, but it was a simple thing to do. It just took a smart person to come up with it. Um, and now they're all over the world because pop machines, vending machines of all sorts do all those sorts of things now for you automatically. Um, Omni-channel engagements, uh, personalizations, personalized service amongst the different systems. Uh, virtual agents using virtualization and, and bots, chat bots to interact and uh, work with customers. Um, agent productivity is increased, of course, because everything is unified and so we don't have to go through the process of retrieving information. And we can also create uh, insights using artificial intelligence as well. And so we have a better way of managing information on demand, right? So we have different types of work orders. Uh, we can allocate and allow customers to create work orders from the portal rather than having to sit in on a, on a phone line and wait for being on hold to have that created. Once that work order has been created automatically, you can find the uh, uh, execute a predefined trigger, and then that trigger will go and do something in the system, right? You know, to do whatever it is it needs to do based on whatever that trigger has, has been fired for. Um, there could be a number of different types of agreements, so we can create and define different types of agreements, do SLAs, making sure that SLAs are adhered to, um, setting up agreements for different types of statuses, as well as using Azure IoT and being able to automatically create items in the system based on uh, values and replicated uh, uh, triggers that have been fired from IoT devices. Also, you could better plan the work because you could schedule and dispatch it much easier using universal resource scheduling, which will mean that only available technicians will be scheduled. So you don't have to go and look to see, oh, is George available? Oh, no, George isn't available for two weeks. Oh, I can't assign him for that. I'm just going to sign it to them anyways, you know. So the system won't allow you to do anything if the user isn't available. Also, it'll have intelligent scheduling optimization. So there's three modes. There's manual, semi-automated, semi-automated, and fully automated. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to look at all of your scheduling and manipulate and optimize the schedule in its best form so that the, the technicians are utilized to their best uh, ability. So whether it's the the path or the route that they're taking to get from all of the different service calls to the types of service calls that they're executing to whatever it happens to be. And you can see in the screenshot there that there's a map on the left-hand side where the technicians can, will actually have a path to follow 
uh, and in order to execute all of the different types of work that they need to complete. And better enable the technicians, better information, better scheduling, um, better mobility, the mixed reality, we talked about that previously, and then the use of the different types of bots, which could be used for product information, things like schematics or diagrams and so forth as well. We also have the ability to better engage customers with customer service because uh, we now have customer portals that the users can log into and, and work with. Uh, we have live technician tracking, you know, so the days of, oh, he's, a, you know, he's two hours away or he's, he's at the lights or, you know, that sort of thing. Those are all no longer, you know, valid excuses for, for where a technician is. You could do live technician tracking. Um, you could have text notifications so that, you know, you don't, you don't have to have that two hour window anymore. You know, oh, I need to be home from, you know, noon till five or something like that. Um, you can have notifications that come in to say, okay, the, the technician will be there in an hour, um, you know, so that the, uh, the customer can plan for it. And then customer history. Uh, you can have the technician go in there with a complete view of the history of that customer and whatever else that customer's journey has been, whether it's the same piece of equipment. You know, as an example, let's say that, you know, it's still still cold up in parts of the world, you know, you still need your furnace and uh, your, or your boiler. And so, you know, the, the technician may have been there two or three times. And so they'll have a complete list of all of the issues that have existed on that boiler. You know, maybe that's where they find out that there's customer error. You know, the customer is just doing something wrong. And so it's not really a big problem. So we don't necessarily need to send a field tech. We could do it over the phone or whatever. But, you know, that that customer history is vital to the uh, technicians so that they know who and how they're dealing with uh, information. And then from here, we can analyze and visualize all of the data. And we will do that all in a tool called Power BI. Power BI allows us to, to take data, raw data in tables, visualize that data, and, and be able to see right away specific insights to help make decisions quicker and better and more efficient and more accurate. We can also use different tools such as uh, tools from Azure IoT uh, to have data streams to uh, things like be proactive and break fix scenarios or help to be uh, proactive and be predictive in terms of the types of service that we want. Uh, it can also help with scheduling and maintenance. And lastly, with ERP integration and inventory tracking, making sure the parts that we require to actually process or do a repair are there and in place so that I don't have to wait and put Mr. Customer on hold and say, oh, I'm sorry, sir, uh, you know, we thought that we had the part, but it turns out it's gonna be six weeks now and, and so forth. So, you know, that doesn't make customers happy sometimes. All of this is supported by the Microsoft ecosystem. And so around, and this particular one is talking specifically about modern finance, but here we have the breakdown of customers, employees, and how they interact with each other. Those are the main stakeholders. <clears throat> but also for an organization that has financial ties, we have vendors, we have uh, banks that we have to deal with, we have insurance companies that we need to deal with, and we will be dealing with those individuals through both things like supply chain management, as well as the human resources tools that are available in the system as well. But modern finance is made up of accounts receivable, accounts payable, and financial management, which is really you know, what every business does. Everybody buys stuff, everybody sells stuff, everybody pays bills, right? It's just a matter of how you specifically do those sorts of things within your organization. So under, uh, so we've got things like account management, intercompany, uh, managements and consolidations, financial period closings, budgeting, analytics and reporting, expense management, and fixed assets. Those are something that cross across all of the modern finance modules. Um, but then from there, we break it down into smaller things such as port policies and chart of accounts and credits and collections and, and all those sorts of types of things that work in conjunction with other components in the system to give us this financial platform that we can execute against. Um, on the bottom of that, of course, is the administration of the system where we have clients, whether they're on-premise using a web browser or at home on a web browser, or maybe on a mobile device using 
uh, the, the mobile app or some sort of power platform app that's integrated into uh, to finance and operations. And then from there, we have user management, automation, data, application management, and integrations. And all of those things working together give us the current implementation of Dynamics 365 Finance and being able to manage an organization from a financial point of view. So in finance and operations, there are a number of core uh, products uh, listed here. Um, most of them are self-explanatory, uh, but all of these are different tools that are available in the system. Uh, we also have things such as cost accounting, consolidations, regulatory compliance, taxing, uh, regulatory discovery and alerting services, you know, uh, all those sorts of things. So these are all of the standard finance topics or finance tools uh, that would be existing in the system. And here from a supply chain management are all of the uh, supply chain management features such as processing, production control, production reporting, inventory management, demand forecasting, warehouse management, vendor collaboration, master planning, all of the, 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 the supply chain type of functionalities that we would need in an organization are in this particular section of the tool. And then lastly, we want to uh, get close to the end here, but we want to start taking a look at the idea of transactional versus analytical data, because even though we're putting a lot of data into the system, we still need to know how to interact with it. And so um, here we can show you as an example, the the way that we're willing to work with data that exists in the system. So we've got data that we're doing on a, on a daily basis, right? Where a customer goes to buy something, right? Uh, we will then create a, a purchase order to buy it from the vendor. The vendor will ship it to us. The items then arrive and they get registered. We will then um, have them in our inventory management, okay? And uh, it will load it into our warehouse. From there, we may sell to a customer, we may just use them internally, but ultimately those are transactionals, uh, transactional data that we're keeping about each process that's going on in this, this, this whole um, flow. Once we've completed this flow, however, we take it from being transactional data because it's not live actual data that we're being used now, it then becomes analytical data because it's happened in the past, right? So once we've made the purchase of that particular item and the purchase has been paid for, that no longer becomes a transactional process, that now becomes an analytical process. And so that data becomes more analytical and is more useful from an analytical point of view in conjunction with other data that we've collected about processes for purchasing and so forth, than the, uh, uh, the individual transactions themselves. So, so you're going to have in your system both types of data. You're going to have ind independent transactional data for stuff that's happening now, and then analytical data for stuff that's happened in the past. Come on, there you go. So here now you can see all of the other lines that are added to this that give you all of the analytical data. So the transfer information, the delivery information, the shipment information, all that stuff you know, as it goes from being transactional to analytical, because then I can go back and I can see, well, did the vendors pay on time? Sorry, did the vendors ship on time? Did they or did they deliver the right now a number of items that were purchased? Um, uh, were there any quality issues with them and that sort of stuff? So there's all sorts of different types of anal analysis that you can do against those records to find out whether or not things are working properly. If we're using a digital feedback loop, such as um, chatbots or uh, customer service uh, vendor applications, sorry, customer service portals and you know IoT devices and all those sorts of things. Here we can see sort of the, the modern supply chain management structure. So we have inbound logistics, the management of them once they're arrived, maybe manufacturing and the execution of manufacturing that needs to be completed to produce an end product, then the warehousing of those end products, the uh, outbound logistics of those products and then the actual transportation to the customer of those products. So um, so here you can see uh, that how each part of the loop will interact with each other to make sure that the whole supply chain process is uh, is functioning 
as best as it can. A couple of other tools that are available. Um, the Business Central, as I mentioned before, Business Central is, is, a, is the new name for a tool called Navision. It's designed for smaller organizations that are wanting to get into an ERP system. And it automatically puts together processes for uh, financials, sales, service, and operations. And so it's, it's a scale, it's much like finance and operations, but it's on a much smaller scale um, and it's for a smaller organization. These are the core capabilities of the Business Central tool, including financial management, uh, standard banking, uh, sales and service management, project management, supply chain management, operational management, and reporting and analytics. So you can still use this to do manufacturing. You can still do this for warehouse management. You can still use this for inventory management. It's just much on a, on a much smaller scale. And human resources, which is another tool. Uh, the human resources tool is for professionals in the workforce to, uh, to find people that are going to build your organization and work with your organization. And so this is where you have the uh, human resources professionals that work in your organization as well as the managers and the employees and the processes that they will work through, including things such as payroll and benefits, um, training, um, certifications, you know, any of that sort of stuff, as well as recruitment. And some of the out-of-the-box features that exist within the human resources tool include uh, organizational management, employee experience, leave and absence and extensibility, and all of the functions that relate to those types of items. Microsoft Commerce, D365 Commerce, is uh, the, the front-end or integrated end-to-end -end commerce solution for your retail business. So it supplies not only brick-and-mortar, on-premise uh, retail functionality, but also for an e-commerce functionality as well. So being able to set up a store front-end, do uh, you know, purchasing online, inventory management from online, and, uh, and work in, in conjunction with your on-premise systems. So uh, it, it's nice because it allows people to not only work in a, uh, you know, have to go into a store or do stuff in a store, physical store, they can also integrate with online stuff. As an example, you could purchase something online and then go to a store to pick it up or, you know, or go to a store and buy it because they don't have it in stock and then use the commerce system to help send and mail it to you automatically when it becomes in stock and that sort of stuff. It also works with uh, cross management for uh, inventory management as well and warehouse management so that you can have a, uh, a standard shopping process uh, throughout the uh, organization. So you have things such as um, awareness of applications through different types of uh, media, um, evaluation of products, buying of products, and then lastly, what happens after you purchase the product. And then from a business side of view, from a back office side of view, you have the planning and procurement pieces, the merchandising and distribution of them, the marketing of them, the sales operations around them, and then lastly, fulfilling them and delivering them to the customer. I have a, one other thing to show you here. This is around uh, sort of the idea of uh, what you need to do if you want to continue with this process, uh, the learning of this process. Um, as part of the uh, development and uh, and creation of lab uh, lab exercises for uh, training. Um, there is a, a customer engagement journey that you could follow uh, for all of the different tools. So including sales, marketing, customer service, field services, and uh, customer data platforms, uh, as well as a fundamental CRM exam, which is a MB910. You'll notice that the other ones, they have uh, different exams as well for a PL200, 210, and so forth. Um, and these exams are, are geared to give you a certification that will show you, uh, you know, that you've acquired specific sets of skills and knowledge to be able to implement and support those particular applications within the organization. Uh, so um, we've got uh, here from the, from the finance and operations point of view, <clears throat> we've got functional consultants in supply chain, finance, uh, manufacturing, commerce. Uh, as well as application development and business central, and then um, also architecture uh, certifications. So uh, myself, I have all of the certifications that are listed on that page with the exception of 920, um, but then I've, uh, I've been working on these products for a lot of years, so I didn't do the fundamentals. I went right to the, 
the regular ones, but I am a certified architect in uh, dynamics. So to, uh, to make your career a little more profitable, um, formidable, uh, you can get certifications and a lot of uh, organizations will look for these certifications uh, when hiring. Um, and so the, the best way or the, one of the, the simplest ways to learn this material is to do role-based instructor-led classroom training um, where you will actually have about a 50-50 split or 60-40 split of instruction from the lecture and labs, uh, lab exercises. So you'll actually get uh, your hands dirty and uh, play in the system. Uh, you get 180 day access to virtual lab environments uh, for, your, for, for not only the course time, but also afterwards, so you can go back and uh, try different things and play, play with stuff based on the lab exercises and the lab guides. Uh, and then you also get 365 day access to the recordings that the instructors have, uh, have made during the original uh, creation of that class. Uh, you can have free opportunity, the opportunity for free repeats, and there's 24-7 support uh, for those virtual environments if you need them. Um, and obviously, the benefits of certification, you stand out, you know, you, 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 know, you get that badge that says, hey, I did this certification. Um, the employees themselves or the employers themselves can verify that, uh, you know, that the uh, employee actually has passed those certifications. They tend to earn more. Um, you know, based on the type of certification they have and in the industry that they're in, they tend to earn more and helps to make their employability better because it does show that they've got background and knowledge in that particular tool. And there is a book available. It's in the uh, event folder that you've gotten today, and it's called The Win-Win of Certification. And it just walks through and talks about things such as impact of training, um, uh, benefits for your, uh, your career based on certification, um, continuous learning, you know, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of information that's packed into that uh, into that manual, but it's a quite a, a useful tool to uh, to help you uh, work for, towards uh, increasing your your um, your value of your certifications and the value of your career. Uh, Microsoft has uh, implemented a renewal process as well. So the uh, certifications now um, don't last forever, like in the old days. Uh, generally, you'll get two years from the point of where you pass your exams to uh, do your renewal. The renewal, though, however, is open book. It's online. There's no charge. Um, and you'll get notified six months prior to the ex uh, expiration of your current certification. And you can try as many times as you need to to pass that certification exam. If you pass the exam, you get to keep your certification for another two years. Uh, if you don't pass the exam within the uh, allocated time, then you'll have to write the full exam, which means that you'll have to pay and sit it at a training center. So let's get trained and uh, get everybody to the point where they can work with the system sufficiently and uh, make sure that everything works properly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the presentation on the topic. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a moment and hear from Sagnik. He is, our vendor manager or marketing manager <laughs> and he's going to introduce some promotions and webinar related courses today Sagnik, are you with us yes ma'am a very good morning awesome. to all thank you for joining us i'm going to share the screen with you and we'd love to hear what you can tell us about this topic <laughs> sure thing is my screen visible it is Great. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, Brent. It was an amazing session as always. And uh, so without uh, wasting any more time of our participants, I would keep it very short and direct. So a uh, couple of things. First and foremost is this resource that all the participants of this event are getting today. This is the handout that we have prepared for all of our learners today. Uh, it has some of the basic uh, resources, some things that are relevant to you, uh, to the topic that has been covered today. You'd find the session recording link over here. So if you want to, the session has been recorded. So uh, in case you want to revisit some of the concepts and understand things better, feel free to do that. Um, this uh, session as part of the overall package all the participants today have been given access to the netcom 365 learner portal this is one of our flagship uh, solutions uh, in the l d industry and 
it has been widely used by clients, government, corporate, uh, across the board, everyone loves this. So we invite you to explore this portal that we have. It gives you access to all our upcoming classes. You can explore uh, what are the ongoing classes, some of the GTR schedules, uh, some of the upcoming webinars and master classes. You get everything from here. So this is your go-to learning portal. Feel free to explore it. Um, the access, uh, you have to follow the simple uh, setting up the password procedure. If you're logging in for the first time, the uh, email ID is your uh, is the one that you have used to register for this event today. Um, the completion certificate, if you are interested in getting that, it would be available from this portal as well along with the Microsoft official courseware that you're getting as part of this masterclass today, it would also be available in this portal. So we encourage all of you to please uh, go through this and explore it and uh, continue your learning journey. So very quickly, I would take you through some of the other offers currently running on the Microsoft training portfolio. And the first and the foremost thing, if you are particularly uh, from an enterprise uh, perspective, if you have a team who, and you're looking for upskilling on Microsoft solutions across Azure, Security, Microsoft 365, or Dynamics 365, something today we have covered, and uh, even Power Platform, basically the entire official Microsoft training portfolio. And if you have a team and you're looking for upskilling, Microsoft Skilling is our in-house program to support you in those endeavors. So feel free to get started, you know, get on a call with us, schedule a demo. It's a free session with our learning consultants and we can discuss based on your specific needs, your organizational objectives with respect to the specific products and the solutions. Uh, we would be uh, preparing a highly optimized and effective skilling plan that you can deploy in phases. And it comes with all the perks, right? So you get access to the corporate uh, portal on NetConf365, which is specifically designed for the decision makers. It gives you access to various insights and information about how your learners from your company are doing, where they are, and how things are rolling, the financial reporting and everything you'd find there. Apart from that, uh, as part of Microsoft Skilling, since it is enterprises and we are a preferred gold managed learning partner with Microsoft, we have access to multiple programs, right? And that often allows us to provide massive advantages to enterprises uh, with uh, discounts. Uh, one of these major benefits being discounted pricing for our enterprise uh, you know, uh, learning programs and learning plan deployments, up to 80% discounts can be availed. So there is a big price advantage that can be leveraged to optimize and maximize your training budgets. Um, also, we provide uh, setup and solutions that allow for easy enrollment of the learners and deployment across multiple locations. So we highly encourage you to, if you have certain requirements or you're, even you're considering exploring that possibility, get started, uh, get on a free demo session with one of our learning consultants, have a scaling plan session, and we can take things forward from there. Um, this collateral has already been shared with all the participants today. Uh, feel free to explore this. This ebook is an official ebook, official collateral that comes from Microsoft, and they have done some extensive research across their entire massive clientele, and you get hard facts and statistics proving the ROI, the evidence of return on investments with respect to Microsoft training and certifications and the benefits that you get to see from both the employer as well as the employee perspective. Uh, we do also offer some individual as well as group level uh, solutions uh, that are uh, there to maximize your training budget in order to continue your uh, you know, learning journeys. So NetCom Plus is one of those offerings. This is our basically the subscription model. It is applicable across uh, 500 plus training classes, uh, including the entire Microsoft portfolio with over 60 official courses. And it's valid for a period of 12 months, right? So it gives you that leverage, that flexibility uh, that you 
that you keep and continue learning all around the year. And it starts at two triple nine per learner per year. But if you are an enterprise with multiple uh, learners to enroll, obviously you get additional discounts that our learning consultants would be happy to take you through uh, if when you discuss. Uh, there is also a learning passport, massively successful solution highly uh, enjoyed by enterprises uh, wherein you park a certain amount with us and you get massive massive uh, benefits on it up to 100 percent increase in your training fund value and it's uh, it covers the entire portfolio of netcom learning right we are an authorized partner with every leading a vendor in the market so uh, microsoft aws cisco confia adobe you name it, you know, it, it, it's covered under Netcom Learning's Learning Passport and you get access to the entire portfolio, same benefits, flexibility around 12 months, and it doesn't get better than that. Um, uh, as uh, discussed uh, by our instructor today, uh, he has taken you through some of the basic courses that are mapped to Dynamics 365 training journey. And we have listed out some of the courses here. Feel free to explore directly through this links or from our website. We have also tagged uh, some of our upcoming master classes as well. So feel free to explore those as well if, uh, to continue your learning journey. Um, one of the things I'd quickly take you through is uh, this is our website, right? Netcomlearning.com. And once you land here, we have certain other options for you if you're particularly interested in Dynamics 365 and continuing your journey around it. So if you just simply go to promotions, you would find uh, we have certain offerings um, because the session that you attended today, it was a standard a uh, standard agenda that was delivered by our instructor. But if you are an enterprise and you have a team and you are looking for a private group training that can be tailored to your specific requirements, uh, you can explore our free Microsoft Dynamics 365 training. This is a two hour instructor led private group session that can be tailored as per the requirements of the specific requirements of your team. So feel free to explore that if it is relevant to your requirements right now. Also, when you go to the Microsoft vendor page on our website, you would find the certification, the role-based certification paths. Uh, you can find our brochures and you can explore all the courses here. We highly encourage you to go through this and uh, get in touch with us if you need uh, guidance in order to understand what specific uh, products and solutions uh, best fit your needs. So all of that. Last but not the least, if you are also looking at Power Platform, currently we have a great option to uh, leverage uh, and it is one of our exclusive offerings. Uh, Netcom Learning is has partnered with Microsoft and has an exclusive early access to the PL100 Capstone Project Pilot. So if you go to the our website and you scroll down under what's new section, you'd find this PL100. So if you are interested in the Power Platform App Maker, this is the best time to get enrolled in this course because right now the particular schedule of April 5th to April 8th with the three days official VILT, we are offering a one day Capstone Project Pilot it's an official Microsoft offering, something Microsoft is rolling out in stages and selective exclusive uh, uh, you know, pilots. And this is a golden opportunity that you get to be part of something that is exclusive and firsthand from Microsoft through Netcom Learning. So feel free to explore the course, the agenda, everything is listed here. And if you have a team to enroll, uh, feel free to explore the enterprise discounts that we have. So that's about it uh, from my end. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Leela. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you. Once again, I know it takes a lot uh, to take your time out of these Saturdays to do this, and we always appreciate your time and everyone's time who joins us. We hope you all found today's webinar to be very informative, and we look forward to seeing you back here with us very soon. Also, feel free to tell your friends and colleagues about our webinars and other courses. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful Saturday.